Welcome to Building Tomorrow, where the future is free. I'm your host, Paul Matsko, and I've been thinking a lot recently about the idea of progress. Now, when I say that word today in 21st century America, it's not a particularly remarkable thing to say. We take progress for granted. We just kind of assume that things have gotten better during our lifetimes and will continue to get better in the future. Our electronics will get faster and cheaper. Our standard of living will grow higher. And the improvements to our society over the past few hundred years, from the rise of modern liberal democracy and markets to the attenuation of racism, anti-Semitism, and misogyny, all of that will just continue. That's just an assumption. It's an act of faith. Yes, we've progressed significantly across many dimensions in the modern era, but progress is never guaranteed. It's fought for, it's contingent, it's incremental. Indeed, the idea of progress itself had to be invented before we could actually progress. Put yourself in the shoes of your great, great, 20 times great grandparent who was a medieval peasant. I know everyone likes to imagine that your ancestors were royalty, but the odds are that your median ancestor was a pig farmer or some such. But take a second and think about what progress would have meant to your distant ancestors. If you could jump in a time travel machine and say, what does progress mean to you, grandpappy? Nothing. It would have meant nothing. They would have wrinkled up their eyes and wondered if you were daft. The idea that things will just get better over time by some ineluctable law of society would have been utterly alien to someone conditioned to think in terms of the harvest cycle, who marked the passage of time by which years had good harvests and which ones were lean, you know, when they're going to starve, who never traveled more than a few miles from their birthplace. Perhaps if they lived near one of the larger towns, they might be able to comprehend progress by tracking the construction of the cathedral, but it was started generations before their birth and would be completed long after they were dead. But during the Enlightenment, philosophers invented the idea of progress. I don't have time to dig into this fascinating story, but it was an act of creation, a drawing forth of a thing that barely existed through imagination and willpower. Life could get better if only because we were determined to make it so. But if the idea of progress had to predate the fact of progress, if you will, then that should also be a cause for concern. It means that we might be able to disinvent progress, to shed the belief in social, technological, and scientific advancement that has propelled modernity. It is dangerous to take progress for granted. Now, thankfully, there are people who are pushing back against our lackadaisical attitudes towards progress. So Aaron and Powell and I asked one of them, Jason Crawford, to join our show. Jason is the author of the website, The Roots of Progress. He's a former software developer and a startup founder. Welcome to the show, Jason. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. Okay, so progress. What is progress? How do you define that concept? Uh, progress is anything that helps us live our lives better. So in, uh, in technology and industry, progress means economic progress, more wealth, more income, uh, more savings, more technology, more uh, industrial capacity, more ability to control our world. In science, uh, progress means more knowledge, more data, more theories, more understanding of the world and and ability to, you know, know what's going on around us and and predict it. And in society, uh, progress means better government, more peace, more freedom, more human uh, rights, civil rights, individual rights, economic rights, um, and you and universal rights, uh, you know, for for everyone equally. So that's what I mean by progress. I judge it by a humanistic standard, Does life, pro- happiness, thriving and flourishing. Does progress, though, have – the term we typically think of it as almost having a direction. Progress means moving forward. But by your definition, it's anything that helps us lead our lives better. Progress could move backwards too. Like we you know, we took a wrong turn. Maybe we're all on social media and things got really bad and progress would be going back to the way things were. Um, possible. 
I think, you know, if you look at the history of progress, uh, literally just rolling things back or kind of undoing steps is rarely how we fix problems. So, I mean, let me say, first off, progress is not automatic or inevitable, right? There's nothing, there's no law of nature that says that it must happen at all or that things must, you know, go in a positive direction. Um, for various reasons, we can slow, we can stagnate, we can even regress, we can lose the things that we've made. And even when we're trying to move forward, Progress is messy. Um, you know, progress is not a simple linear thing where uh, we always know what to do next and every step is positive and every step is forward and we never make mistakes and we never, no, it doesn't work that way at all. Um, progress entails risk, progress entails setbacks, progress entails mistakes. And, uh, and sometimes those mistakes are harmful or destructive. But if you look at the history of, um, you know, what, what usually happens when we, uh, when we make, you know, when we mess up somehow, um, Usually what happens is we don't go backwards. We actually go forwards. We don't remove uh, things that we, we don't. We don't undo things. We we add things. So, for instance, you know, automobiles, right? When automobiles were invented. They were a, a boon to humanity, but they also entailed new safety risks. We didn't roll back the automobile, uh, literally or figuratively. We didn't uh, undo it or stop automobiles. We added safety features, right? We added seatbelts. Um, we added all kinds of, uh, th not to mention, we added traffic you know, regulations. We added all kinds of ways to make driving uh, safer. X-rays are another example uh, that I tend to use. So we discovered X-rays. We discovered that they had medical applications. Then we discovered that they were killing people if you overexposed uh, you know, people to X-rays. Well, we didn't stop using X-rays. We developed safety standards for them, right? We minimize the use of them now to medical necessity. We uh, put shielding in front of the parts of the body that don't need to be X-rayed um, and so forth. So, you know, the, it's pretty rare. Uh, uh, you know, if you think about what are the things that we literally just uh, hit, sort of hit the undo button on, well, Okay, there was a time when we thought putting cocaine in soda was a good idea. Uh, we rolled that back, right? You know, occasionally we just say, "Whoops, yeah, let's not do that. Let's undo." Um, but uh, but that's rare. Usually, usually even the mistakes uh, of progress we fix by moving forward with new mechanisms uh, rather than by simply rolling back. What about the uniformity? of progress and this maybe applies more to progress in institutional changes and social changes but I could see it playing out in technology and science as well that what makes my life go better isn't necessarily what you think makes your life go better and so what I might call progress you think is actually regression or are we only talking about things that we kind of uniformly agree are steps in the right direction? Yeah, um, certainly. Not everybody agrees on progress. Um, any given step, I, I mean, uh, virtually every step in in the the progression of mankind has been questioned, fought, opposed, denounced. Um, you know, so so we never, uh, you know, we never just agree on it. Um, you know, even in the middle of the the nineteenth century, when society as a whole was very gung-ho on progress, at least European society. And, uh, you know, everybody was super optimistic compared to now. Even then there was a backlash. There was this sort of romantic, um, uh, counter movement where, you know, people felt that all of this technology and all the factories and machines and everything were just, uh, taking us away from nature, taking us away from, family taking us away from, you know, kind of all that is good and peaceful and beautiful. Um, and so, you know, even, even, even then not everybody saw it as good. Um, and of course, you know, not every, not every change will benefit everyone, uh, equally, right? Some changes are, you know, every change is going to be sort of, um, you know, good for some people, maybe neutral for some people. Um, uh, you know, there's a few things that are probably pretty universally good when we, you know, started uh, filtering and chlorinating water to purify it and get bacteria out and stop making everybody sick. That was probably pretty universally good. Even that, I'm sure, was opposed uh, and, and fought. There were some people who, had, you know, at least thought it wasn't worth doing and didn't see the value and thought it was just a big waste of time and effort. Um, but I think that did actually clearly, you know, benefit everybody. But on the whole, you know, when you add up, so so at a micro level, when you look at any particular year or any particular innovation. Uh, it's not going to be even. It's going to be, you know, lumpy. It's going to be um, uh, bursty in, on, on a time frame. But uh, uh, but when you zoom out and you look at the 
the broad sweep of decades and centuries and you look across all of society and all of the economy, um, you know, then I think uh, at, at that level, progress is, you know, not not completely smooth or universal, but much closer to that. Um, you know, at the high level, you know, really pretty much everybody benefits and the and the progression is pretty strong, strongly upwards or it has been over the last few centuries. So there's some kind of inherent ambiguity in, in, you know, because people aren't always going to agree about what progress looks like across all domains or, or what counts. Um, but let, let's stipulate let's stipulate this. I think most people get that things are – life is better now across the variety of fields today than it was a few hundred years ago. It's hard to find someone who wouldn't agree with that. Um, so let's kind of stipulate progress. You make the argument with your website that there is an ethical imperative to pursue progress. Can you flesh that out for us? Yeah, I just think if your if your moral standard is what betters human life, what allows us to live, you know, longer, healthier, happier lives, to do more of what we want to do in life, to be more connected to our loved ones, to be, uh, you know, to pursue the careers that we want. Um, to be to be healthy, you know, throughout as much of our lives as possible, et cetera. By that standard, uh, scientific, uh, technological and economic progress over the last few hundred years has done so much good for so many people uh, that, you know, it's got to be regarded as simply the greatest story ever, the greatest gift ever to to, to mankind and to our generation is you know, all of this, this scientific and technological and industrial world that we have built, uh, you know, since, uh, you know, over, over the last few hundred years. And, uh, you know, to take that away from people would be, uh, if we were to somehow, you know, be knocked back to the economy and the world of the, you know, 16 or 1700s, uh, the suffering would be so immense that it would have to be, you know, regarded as the just the the worst form of torture that you could um, that you could put on humanity. So I think when you look at it that way, uh, you know, it it is a moral imperative to keep this going if at all possible, right? If if in in one or two hundred years from now, our descendants uh, can be as well off compared to us today as we are compared to our ancestors from one or two hundred years ago then it's absolutely a moral imperative to to keep that going and and to give them that gift and to not take it away. The, it seems like an argument against that and one that's particularly common among, say, environmentalists um, is that, yes, that's that's great and it's great that we have this economic growth, but at what cost? That we may we may have – if we can move things in the right direction, we ought to do it, but – we don't have the benefit of hindsight to know that the individual choices that we're making are in fact the right direction. And so if we say use up all of the resources, then the economic growth we have today comes at the cost of pretty poor living conditions if they're living at all for people 200 years from now. Um, and this this turns into why, you know, like a lot of them argue, well, what we need to do right now if we really want to make things better in the future or at least sustain what we've got is to say scale back our use of natural resources and emissions and whatever else to like 1850s level, that that's the only sustainable thing. So how does how does that notion of kind of sustainability fit in with progress given that we can't have perfect insight into the future and what our actions will actually look like when they're fully played out? Yeah, of course. Um, well, I mean, first off, we can only go on the best knowledge that we have and the best predictions that we can make. Um, right. By definition, there's 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 nothing else. Um, I I have a different concept of sustainability, and I think it's important to differentiate between a couple of different um, concepts of sustainability. So first off, I absolutely think that we should think and act long term. Right. I uh, I do not advocate uh, simply. Uh, living it up and having a short-term party in this generation while we kind of whittle away or, uh, you know, fritter away all of our resources and then leave nothing to to future generations. That's not um, – uh, I, I would not consider that progress. Progress is or should be sustainable progress. But note that I said sustainable progress. Um, I think that what is important to sustain is that upwards curve. When we talk about sustainability, we have to ask ourselves, what exactly is it that we want to sustain? Now, 
typically these days when people talk about sustainability, they're talking about the sustainability of a particular concrete industrial process or resource such as, uh, you know, so uh, burning of fossil fuels is not sustainable because there's a finite amount of them, an enormous amount, by the way, but a finite amount. And so we're using them up. And so we can't continue that forever. Um, you know, whereas something that uh, depends on solar power, um, well, even that is going to run out. But I guess it's so many uh, hundreds of millions or billions of years in the future that it's effectively, uh, you know, effectively uh, sort of infinitely in the future and therefore, um, you know, much more, quote unquote, sustainable. But what I think matters is not the sustainability of any particular specific industrial process uh, or, or resource or technology, but rather the sustainability of growth. Um, and part of the way that humanity has sustained growth historically is actually by switching uh, technologies when we run out of particular resources. So if you look at the 19th century, um, a lot of what we depended on, the resources we depended on the 19th century, um, were uh, sort of various types of biomaterials. So um, there was a lot of uh, plant and animal usage. Um, there was a lot of, you know, we used natural fertilizer to uh, to, to grow our crops. We relied on animals for, um, you know, all kinds of uh, bone and shell and hair and horn, ivory, you know, tusks and tortoiseshell combs and, and so forth. Uh, we relied on plants for things like rubber or uh, gutta percha, which was a, an alternate uh, sort of essentially form of, of uh, a rubber-like substance. And uh, what we found was that in the 19th century, as industrial production ramped up, as population grew, as we wanted to make more and more things, as people got wealthier um, and, and wanted more material goods, there just wasn't enough of this stuff to go around. Um, there wasn't, there weren't enough elephants to make all of the billiard balls uh, that we wanted. There weren't enough tortoises to make all of the combs. There wasn't enough uh, rubber and gutta percha to make insulation for all the electrical wires that we were stringing all over the place. Um, and so in the 19th century, oh, and there definitely wasn't enough fertilizer uh, to feed everybody. So uh, what happened was we made a shift in all of these cases to much more abundant mineral resources. Um, especially oil. So oil became our new lighting instead of the sperm whales. Uh, oil became the basis for plastics, which replaced a lot of animal uh, products such as bone, shell, and horn. Um, uh, it also, uh, plastics also replaced, uh, in, in many cases, rubber and gutta percha. So, um, oh, and of course, uh, the, the Haber-Bosch process gave us synthetic uh, ammonia, which is the precursor of synthetic fertilizers. So now we could make fertilizer uh, literally from air and water uh, through through an industrial you know chemical process so that was how we sustained growth uh, by switching away from these uh, you know bio sources which actually may today be considered quote unquote sustainable because they're biological um, but they were not going to sustain the the economic growth rates and the improvements in the standard of living that we wanted to sustain now today we're using you know these mineral resources uh, especially oil and uh, we have, you know, decades, if not centuries of, uh, you know, of oil left by the estimates that I've seen. But however much time it is, sure, it's finite. All that means is that we need to keep moving forward, develop technologies and, uh, you know, find better uh, and, and uh, you know, new and even more abundant uh, resources uh, and processes that can sustain the next level of uh, a growth. Nuclear power, for instance, is extremely fuel efficient, right? An extremely tiny amount of, uh, of nuclear fuel gives you an enormous amount of energy compared to any other, um, you know, fuel source uh, pound for pound. So, um, you know, what we need to be doing is uh, sustaining growth, not specific processes by uh, by switching to these, you know, more uh, abundant and kind of these these new resources and technologies that allow another order of magnitude or multiple orders of magnitude um, of growth. And this is directly opposed to sort of some people's notion of sustainability, which literally advocates degrowth um, and the degrowth movement, I think, is. Uh, one of the most uh, pernicious and one of the things that, that worries me the most about the modern world is that people are seriously advocating degrowth um, a as a solution. I think if you care about human life, degrowth at best is admitting defeat. It's saying, well, 
you know, we wanted to keep uh, moving forward with industrial progress. We wanted to keep improving wealth. We wanted to keep improving standard of living. We wanted to keep lifting people out of poverty. We wanted to keep moving the world forward, but we failed. We couldn't figure out how to do it. We ran out of resources. And so we just had to fall back to a previous, you know, uh, uh, level of poverty, honestly. And uh, I hope we don't do that. What's your, um, so let's say someone brought the uh, counter argument and said, look, you might think of progress as a thing that um, applies to to everything from economic growth to societal progress and, and the like. But what you're really concerned about is is GDP, economic growth, technological innovation. It's material. It's progress in a material sense. But there are more important things that we should measure than <clears throat> material prosperity. Uh, <clears throat> and those are things that don't really fit very well into your uh, system. What would your response be to that? that critique? Um, it's true that material progress is not the only form of progress. Uh, it's not the only form we should pay attention to or care about. You know, At the beginning of this conversation, I outlined three broad areas of progress that I think about, and technology uh, and, and economic progress is only one of the three, the other two being science uh, and society or government. And um, yeah, I absolutely think we should uh, be looking at progress in all of those. And I think over the last you know few hundred years, there has been progress in all of those. Although I admit in society and government, it's the hardest to see and the most difficult case to make uh, that there and, and certainly the place where I would say there has been the least consistent progress and uh, it's been the messiest and there's been the most, um, you know, regress along with uh, progress. So um I think that's difficult, but I think that uh, I think that over the, a long enough time frame, we can see progress in all those areas. And I think going forward, you know, we can make progress in all those areas. I would say also that all of them are really intertwined, um, and and I think they all over a long enough time frame advance or regress together. Um, and we can we can talk about some of those connections. But I just you know want to point out that when people say oh. Uh, even you know, even material progress itself gives us all sorts of spiritual benefits. Think of um, you know, think of how much um, of an emotional and spiritual benefit you get from the ability to uh, see the faces and hear the voices of your loved ones, no matter where they are in the world, right? And compare to uh, you know, in 1800, right? If your if your uh, uh, spouse or children or uh, you know, dearest friend decided they wanted to take a trip across the Atlantic, you know, between Europe and America, let's say. First off, they'd be on the ocean for months, right, incommunicado. Then, uh, you know, one, even when they were on land, right, to, to talk to them, you had to literally send a letter back and forth. If they fell ill, um, you might not hear about it until they were long dead, right? And, uh, you know, so it's just the connection that we've got. Um, think about the the fact that today virtually anyone in the world has access to some form of virtually all of the art that has ever been created, the ability to explore it, whether that's visual art, or which you can find pictures of at least online, whether that's music. You can wake up in the middle of the night and decide that you want to hear your favorite piece of music performed by the greatest artist who ever performed it, living or dead, um, you know, the greatest recording of it they ever did, no matter how spontaneous – you know, or wonderful that was, it's been recorded and you can just, you know, pick up Spotify or your, you know, your iPhone and, and plug in your headphones and, and hear it on demand, you know, anytime. Um, knowledge, right? The expansion of, of our ability to access knowledge through, uh, through the internet, through Google, through Wikipedia. Um, my ability to get uh, so, you know, an enormous library of books on demand through ebooks, through my Kindle uh, reader. I can, you know, the, the promise of Kindle, think of a book and you get it in 60 seconds. Um, so I, I think that, uh, you know, material progress opens up, in, not to mention the time, by the way. Um, if you're familiar with uh, uh, the late, great Hans Rosling and his uh, Gapminder project, he's got this great talk about the washing machine um, and how the washing machine saved uh, time and labor that you would be spending washing clothes. What can you do with that time? Well, his family would go to the library and get books. So he says, it's as if we had a machine where I can put clothes into the machine and books come out. I think that is a marvelous uh, illustration of how material technologies can give us the ability to um, to focus on those spiritual and intellectual values. 
Hmm. Now, I, I'm going to assume that you know you weren't born obsessed with the you know the hockey stick chart of GDP growth. So, wh- when did your own appreciation for the importance of progress uh, develop? Yeah, I got interested in this project and began this project about three years ago. And um, it happened because uh, for a number of reasons, but I would say the biggest and central was that I decided I wanted to re-examine the foundations of my worldview and and my political philosophy. Um, I grew up with a pretty, uh, you know, laissez-faire, free market, uh, individual rights uh, approach, um, very much inspired by um, Ayn Rand and her philosophy of objectivism uh, and just kind of that that general milieu. And uh, I have spent much of my life talking to, you know, many people about philosophy and politics uh, from a variety of backgrounds. And um, what I realized was that uh, people's views of politics uh, depend a lot on what problems in the world they think are important and most pressing. People don't just disagree in politics on how to solve problems. They disagree on which problems matter, right? So um, think of, for instance, a sort of left-wing environmentalist who's very focused on global warming, climate change, uh, versus, say, a right-wing deficit hawk who's very focused on the national debt versus uh, a social justice activist who's very focused on racial inequality. Um, you know, all three of these people, if you get them in a room together, uh, they're they're just going to be talking past each other for the most part because they don't even, you know, each one is focused on their own problem and sees the other one's problems as, you know, perhaps overblown, overhyped, overrated. Um, you know, but this, my thing, my thing is the thing that's going to kill us all, <laughs> right? Uh, and so I asked myself, well, where does my own worldview come from? What's the ultimate justification of it? And what's the justification for caring about the problems that I care about, like long term, um, you know, innovation, uh, uh, economic growth, the vigor of humanity's, uh, you know, push forward into more knowledge and more technology. And I realized that it was ultimately rooted in this keen appreciation for the story of human progress, how far we've come, how much of a struggle it was to get here, how much of an achievement it is, how much of a gift it is that we have all received from our ancestors, um, and how much we ought to appreciate that, and how much it's really underappreciated and taken for granted um, in the culture today, I think. So I, I said to myself, if this is the foundation of my worldview, I better go you know, research it, understand it, see if it actually supports the ideas, you know, that I think it does and and really get to know it on a deeper level. And that's how it began. Now, you've worked as an engineer for a, a number of tech companies, including Amazon, Groupon, and, and you've described what inspires you um, I, I, in that work and in the work you do now. How how ordinary is that? What What role do abstractions like a belief in progress play in motivating uh, the folks like you who work in tech? You know, the tech community um, is a, a pretty broad community of fairly independent thinkers, and there's uh, there's no one mentality uh, that that pervades everyone. I think some people are a lot more focused on uh, are, are, are you motivated by and resonate with this concept of human progress. Um, some are more in the social justice camp and everything. And there's really everything in between. I do think certainly in my own career as a um, – especially as a startup founder and and being involved in some early stage startups, um, I, this, this notion of human progress was at least in the background. And this is another reason I decided to study it was because, you know, being, being a, a, a startup founder is a, is a difficult job. Um, and I would sometimes look in the mirror and say, why am I doing this? <laughs> why did I choose the hardest uh, path? Maybe not the absolute hardest, but why didn't I choose, you know, I could be, I could be making a lot more money and have a lot more stress if I just went and worked at one of the big tech companies, Google or Facebook or something, you know, why, why don't I just do that? Why don't I take, um, the easier, more comfortable path? And there are a variety of reasons. Part of it is just my personality. But part of it is, again, this this keen appreciation of how much I owe to those who came before me over centuries and, and millennia who took the hard path, who did something that no one had ever done before, who had some form of, of innovation to give to all of uh, you know everyone who came after them. And I just feel deep in my soul that if there's any chance that I have – to in some small way do something similar and contribute something new 
uh, you know, to the future of humanity, then I've got a responsibility to at least try, uh, you know, to pay it forward. And that's a deep thing that motivated me and, and another reason that I wanted to go learn this story. Something you said made me think of this this tension that we sometimes see, especially among younger Americans. So you mentioned you mentioned kind of the wide range of ideological views in the Valley, and that some are as pro progress as you, and some are less, and some might even be the kind of anti growth mindset. And when we look at polls of millennials or younger, we, on the one hand, we see things like support for socialism, support for kind of climate change action that would lead to degrowth, to to stuff that's the like slow it down, less dynamism. Um, we need to, you know, make sure that everything is more steady. But on the other hand, there is an exuberance for the new in in terms of embracing the the latest app. Like I'm now I used to think that I was hip and with it, but I'm now old enough that I'm constantly surprised at like there's some big thing that all the young people are into that I have never heard of before. Um, well, you're not on TikTok. I'm, I am not on TikTok. TikTok came around, I think, right at the point when I stopped being aware of the latest social media stuff. Um, and and so they, they run for that and so many of them want to be want to be founders of companies and make new things. And and the valley is full of that sort of dynamism. Is that is that a genuine tension? Um, is or is there is there some way to kind of put those together that makes sense? Uh, you know, I think part of it is just a natural um, uh, human inability to achieve perspective. You know, when people are evaluating a concrete change that's right in front of their face and is affecting their life one way or another, um, you know, most people don't apply the same uh, standards that they use to think uh, abstractly about kind of big picture issues. Um, that's just, it, to my mind, a kind of, uh, you know, universal human or, or a human tendency that has always been around. Uh, you know, there are very few people who I would say like truly take ideas seriously where wherein they they really think hard about what does this abstraction mean? What does this idea mean? What does this philosophy mean? How should it be applied in practice and then kind of like consciously and deliberately apply it to every area of their life? People who, who operate like that are a small minority. Um, you know, most people will adopt some sort of philosophy or ideology um, not purely on intellectual grounds, partly on emotional grounds, partly on tribal grounds, um, you know, a very kind of social, um, very much maybe just uh, the tradition they were, uh, you know, born into or raised in um, or or kind of how they were influenced by their by their friends and family. Um, and then, you know, they'll adopt that. But then, you know, again, when it comes to something that's sort of like concretely right in front of their face, they'll just evaluate it on its own terms in a very concrete way. And I think that's what's going on here. You know, people pick up a certain ideology of um, uh, of of degrowth, of maybe sort of romantic, you know, greenism, where they're they're just picking up this kind of anti-technology, anti, um, you know, anti-progress uh, type of view. And then that's what they, you know, when they choose what, you know, political rally or march to go to and what signs to hold up uh, or how to vote in an online poll, that's kind of what's driving them. But then when you put an app and, you know, in front of their face or an iPhone in their hand, um, right. I mean, it's the irony of all of these activists at, uh, you know, at every rally where they're decrying big oil. And then you look and it looks like every single thing they're wearing or holding in their hand is basically made of oil. <laughs> right. And they don't even know it because they don't know that that plastics and synthetics come from oil because they're not educated in these you know things. So it's you know, it's that kind of paradox. What do you I mean? So we're kind of touching on. The kind of tech backlash, tech lash, if we could be real clever. Um, the um, this kind of neo luddite movement. Do, are there any particular sources? I mean, you're you're rooting this in human nature, a kind of natural tendency to um, privilege the concrete and the immediate over you know abstractions. Um, but th in this particular moment, it seems like we are. I mean, there's something um, historical about this moment like it's not just an ahistorical human nature 
uh, tendency that, that that is that as well. But like you know, skepticism towards tech is peaking right, or is rising, peaking. I don't know. The optimistic will say peaking in the 2010s in a way that it was not in 20 years ago in, in the 90s. Uh, so, what are the particular sources do you think of our neo luddite moment? Um, I think you're right about the tech lash. Um, I don't know if it's a neo luddite exactly. I think it is more. My basic diagnosis is that it it is the typical tendency to, um, and I don't know if this is a distinctly, I, th I think there's something about this that's uh, kind of an American tendency, but maybe it's a more general human tendency to root for the underdog and then to turn against them or to become wary, suspicious, and, and sometimes outright hostile when the underdog becomes the champion, right? So the thing about tech now that I think is, is obvious and clear to everyone that was not the case maybe 10, 15 years ago is that tech now clearly has won and has a lot of uh, power and influence the top uh what you know four or five companies uh, of uh by market cap are all you know big sort of tech giants uh we've got the you know the first few trillion dollar companies right we're all tech giants um you know facebook i think uh, if not already then soon has more active users than the catholic church has members um and and way more than than any country you know has citizens um right there they're over two billion now uh, facebook is I'm pretty sure. So um, and, we, you know, and then we're starting to see, you know, so not only this, but uh, uh, software uh, and, and, and computer companies uh, in, in their various forms are now sort of taking over uh, in, in a way every um, industry. So a lot of the software companies uh, that now and this is, you know, so this is not true a generation ago, but a lot of the software companies now are not pure software companies, right? They're companies that are actually sort of entering a non software industry, such as Uber and Lyft have done in transportation um, or in a way, you know, Amazon did ahead of its time in retail or, um, you know, in a sense, all the social media companies are media companies. And so all these these companies are sort of, you know, it was one thing when you had Microsoft as the tech giant and Microsoft was just making software that ran on computers uh, and it didn't seem to be, you know, invading and taking over some industry. But now we've got uh, these tech giants and they're uh, and they're coming and they're they're sort of disrupting every every industry. Um, it's it's the old Mark Andreessen line about software is eating the world, which is probably the most prescient, you know, one of the most one of the best predictions of, of the 2010s. Uh, and so I think that's what's happening. People are seeing this. Um, and any time that some person, company or industry, you know, rises to that level of influence, I won't say power because that's a loaded word, but let's just say influence. Um, and, uh, you know, and especially if they do so rapidly or if it seems to come, you know, on people very much out of nowhere, I think there's this uh, there's this tendency to view that with suspicion. Um Right. I mean, in a sense, it's no different than in, at the end of the 19th century when there were, you know, that when you had the rise of big corporations and, you know, the the huge railroads and huge financial companies, J.P. Morgan and all those folks um, back then as well. People viewed that with suspicion and felt that there was this, you know, for for whatever reason and whether, you know, with or without justification, they saw it as this concentration of power that was pernicious and felt that needed to be slapped down. And this is a recurring theme, certainly in American history and, and maybe broader than that. Mm. So it's not about tech per se, but about kind of social institutional construction in the shape of society. That that, that makes sense. Um, now, you're someone who has a foot in kind of two um, technological worlds, in a sense, you were you, you're part of software eating the world. I mean, you're as a programmer developer in the valley, um, but you also are interested now. A lot of a lot of your articles on your website are about like iron extraction and smelting and physical technology as opposed to digital technology. Um, I, I, as someone who is, but but yet today we're in a place where a lot of people when they hear tech. In fact, even how we've been using it in this conversation, tech means Silicon Valley means software to the modern mind. We think of software as technology, and there's a lot of development and progress in that regard. Why do you think we've come to the point where tech and digital innovation have become so nearly synonymous, and why do we not see equivalent progress? Um, why does it feel like the pre-digital era is when we made physical technological progress. And now we're in a digital era where most progress is digital. 
Yeah, great question. That is that is like an uh, an open question of of you know debate, discussion, and research. Um, it's true. So first off, you know, technology in its broadest sense, of course, is doesn't just mean computers and the internet. Um, and in the you know the 1830s, the highest tech and most exciting you know place to be was in railroads and locomotives. Um, and uh, you know, maybe in the in the end of the century, it was electricity. And so, um, you know, in in my work, so I, you know, I did spend most of my career in the tech industry. Um, I have made a shift now, and I'm I'm working full time on uh, what is now termed progress studies, um, researching the history of technology and writing about it on my blog. Uh, and so, you know, in with that focus, since I'm focused on human progress as such, I've been looking broadly across the board um, at everything from, you know, steel and cement to uh, electricity to medicine, antibiotics, vaccines, sanitation, uh, to, you know, the history of the bicycle. Uh, and I've covered all those on my blog. Um, you know, as for, you know, what's going on now, it's true that uh, the, you know, most of the innovation, it feels like in the last 50 years or so, um, you know, has really the, like the really huge leaps um, have been in information technology, in computers, in the Internet and in the convergence of all of our electronic devices and electronic all of our forms of communication and recording and processing information, you know, convergence into uh, digital and, and, and the computer at the core. Um so uh, there's sort of two ways to look about, at that. I would say one way is, in a certain sense, this is natural. All areas of technology go through uh, these kind of S curves, where they start off slow as people are just figuring them out. Then they reach a uh, they reach a kind of inflection point. And they start accelerating really fast as uh, as they go through this exponential growth, and then you know at a certain point uh, they've kind of they start nearing the limits of the applications that they can have. The world gets saturated with this technology. Um, it starts to mature and it starts to level off and plateau. And so you get what's called an S curve. Um, now all technologies go through this. It's pretty natural. Um, what uh, you know, people have been so there's this uh, there is this hypothesis now about uh, are we in the middle of something of a stagnation? Has progress actually slowed down? I don't have a strong opinion on that question, although I've seen some evidence uh, that 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 indicates that. Um, but it, so when you step back and look at it from these S curves, I think what you, what you, you know, what you might say is that we've been going through this, uh, tech, uh, I, I, I almost just use the word technology again in, in the narrow sense. We've been going through this sort of computer software and internet, uh, S curve. Uh, it is maybe starting to, you know, uh, the growth of that is maybe starting to slow down because it's in a natural way because it's kind of, uh, you know, hitting, it's starting to mature and, and, and we're seeing the beginnings of the plateau. Uh, but what hasn't happened, you know, what's been the, the case in the past is there's been multiple S curves going on at once and they're overlapping. Um, so, you know, oil and electricity, for instance, were sort of going on at the same time, like two two very different forms of energy technology that actually work together. Um, and then, you know, coming right on the heels of that was the automobile, the you know, internal combustion engine, the automobile, uh, mass manufacturing was getting figured out at that point. And then right after that, we had plastics and we had antibiotics. And so there were kind of all these different things all across a variety of areas that all these overlapping S curves that were going on at once. And so if one was starting to plateau perhaps others were still you know going strong one hypothesis is okay it looks like now maybe we're starting to hit the plateau of computer technology what's the new s curve to uh, to 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 replace it and, and keep growth going and maybe there isn't one and maybe that's the problem now that doesn't mean there isn't one on the near horizon uh, you know, near in a in sort of a grand historical context, I'm very optimistic about the future of biotech. I think there's a revolution there waiting to be happen, but that that might still be a couple of decades out. Uh, and so, you know, maybe there's a gap in between the S curves. Um, now, how did that happen? How did the world get into that position? I don't know. I think that's a really interesting theme of future research. Hmm. Very interesting. Um, I, I, I'm thinking <clears throat> here that. People who favor progress, and I'd include us at Building Tomorrow with with, with you on that, um, we confront an issue, which is that we are always inclined um, 
to take for granted past progress, that progress recedes into the assumed background, if you will, that once we have a thing, it's marvelous and new and magical for a brief moment, and then it becomes mundane and ordinary. We forget the story of struggle and growth and progress that informed it. I, I was thinking of this. I watched, um, oh, whatever the movie about um, the current war current wars um, about Nikola Tesla and Edison and, and you know, yep. uh, and Westinghouse, and Westinghouse um, who I suppose is kind of the real hero of the story. Um, but uh, and it, it, they clearly thought of it as as magic. I mean, not they were scientists, but I mean, people were like, wow, this transforms our lives. And it was a, an everyday marvel and how quickly I mean, how different that is from our attitude about electricity and that across basically every innovation, every example I can think of of growth, how quickly we lose our wonder and awe at uh, growth and progress. How do we how do we um, how do we mitigate that as people who favor uh, uh, growth and progress? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Um, there's a there was a great quote and um, I'm trying to remember uh, I think it was from Douglas Adams uh, it was something along the lines of just gotta, you know getting it from memory it was something like you know any technology that um, you know comes along uh, before your age you know 15 or so is just like part of the natural order of things uh, any technology that comes along between you know the age of 15 and 35 for you is really cool and new and exciting and you could probably make a career in it and anything you know that comes along after age 35 is an abomination that's against the natural order of things <laughs> like tiktok for Aaron. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, yeah right exactly <laughs> so um i i think that's a there's it's humorous but there's a, a grain of of truth in that in uh and you're absolutely right that we take progress for granted we forget even progress that happened within our own lives we forget you know what it was like before and we just very quickly get used to it and i think that you know that's part of one of the things that i'm trying to counter and the way i'm trying to counter it is just by telling the story i think part of the problem is uh the stories are not out there uh, we're, they're not taught i think this is a whole missing uh, subject in education, in both K-12 and university education, students don't learn this stuff. You know, it kind of falls between the cracks of history and science classes. Um, there's no progress class. There's no history of technology. It's, or, you know, it, that stuff is, if it's touched on, it's, it's very little. And so, you know, people just don't, kids just don't learn what life was like. Um, and so, you know, you know, you made a statement earlier in, in this conversation where you said uh, that, um, oh, you know, few people would disagree that uh, we've had an enormous amount of progress the last few hundred years. That's not actually true. Um, many people are unaware of nearly how much progress uh, has happened. They have a false view of the past as this sort of, you know, halcyon la lost, you know, idyllic uh, days, some Garden of Eden that we fell from. Um, and, and people also uh, as again, as Hans Rosling found out, have uh, have a simply factually mistaken view of the current state of the world. If you ask people about uh, poverty, for example, what do you think has happened? You know, how has uh, extreme poverty changed around the world in the in the recent decades? A lot of people will think that it's actually increased. Uh, when the the actual answer, the, the simple fact, the measurable fact, is that it's decreased um, enormously. So. Uh, we need to teach people this, and uh, it's it's not taught in schools, and even an interested layman, I think, has a hard time – like these stories are not very accessible. I go out to research these things, and a lot of the books are dry. They're disorganized. They're dense. You have to wade through a lot of stuff to kind of get the real story or to, or to find the gems. And so part of what I'm trying to do is to take these you know books that only a history buff could love or research papers where stuff is kind of – you know. Um, uh, maybe accessible only to expert researchers in the field. And I'm trying to take that and uh, synthesize it, summarize it, condense it, and kind of tell the essential story in an engaging way, accessible for a broader audience, so that more people can learn these stories. And they are fascinating stories, like when you get into it. This is just amazing, really cool stuff that, that deserves people's attention and I think can be, um, you know, really fun and engaging uh, stories if it's told the right way. 
Now we don't have time for you know the hour and a half uh, uh, kind of level of explanation of the history of iron s- extraction and smelting, which is utterly fascinating. We'll have to put a, li- a link to one of your uh, to an example of one of your full talks uh, in the show notes. But uh, could you give us just real brief a few minutes? What's an example of this kind of you know underappreciated uh, example of technological progress? Something that's become mundane. And uh, that you are kind of trying to excavate and show people just how marvelous it was. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, so you brought up, uh, you know, you brought up iron and steel. Like that's a, a great example. Uh, those things, the you know, that metal is everywhere around us today. Uh, you know, it's in our cars, it's in our buildings, it's in electrical, you know, infrastructure. And yet, you know, before the Iron Age. Uh, metal wa- or iron in particular was had this sort of mythical quality. Um, it was seen as a gift from the gods, and the reason for that is that the only form that it was ever found in was meteoric uh, form. So iron doesn't just exist out in nature in a um, in a convenient form that we can uh, that we can just kind of like make things out of. It it's it's found in the ground. It's it's quite abundant uh, in the ground, but in the form of iron ore. And iron ore basically looks like rust. In fact, I mean chemically, it's it's uh, it's sort of essentially equivalent to rust. It's an, it's iron oxide. It looks like kind of reddish dirt or rock, and uh, it doesn't look like the the sort of thing that you could make a skyscraper out of. Um, and every once in a while, you know, a meteor would fall to the ground, and it would have pure metallic iron in it. it hadn't been oxidized. You can just imagine the uh, you know the the wonder of some. Uh, you know, prehistoric person who went up, you know, this thing falls from the sky with a huge crash. It's got to seem like, you know, like something sent from from the heavens, from the gods. And you go up to it and it looks like a big rock. But when you try to chip away at it, instead of uh, chipping and flaking off like a brittle rock would, it's actually malleable and it bends and it deforms. Uh, you know, that must have been quite amazing. Tutankhamun was buried with a, uh, a dagger, which we believe, based on its nickel content, was made out of meteoric uh, iron. Uh, so it was. It, so it had this kind of mythical status. Oh, and the and the early words for iron, by the way, uh, in in like ancient Egyptian and Sumerian, they ba- they roughly translate as you know metal from heaven or you know metal from the sky. So uh, you know, so so the whole story of that, you know, what we actually found out was you take this reddish rock, and you build an enormous uh, fire. Uh, or you know a really a really hot fire, and you put it the, this red rock uh, crushed up in with charcoal, and you burn it in a furnace for hours and hours, and then you know what will drip out of it is this uh, this kind of spongy iron mass that you can then hammer and and you know through working it over and over with a hammer and tongs and a, and a and a fire you can you know actually turn it into something. You know that's that's quite amazing. Um, and then the whole story of how. Uh, you know, in the in the early days, there are you know blacksmiths would sort of work with the iron, um, and uh, early iron, you know, simple uh, the iron you'd get out of those early smelting processes was actually somewhat soft, and so they kind of you know found all these ad hoc ways to to harden it, which you know thousands of years later we finally figured out. Uh, the chemistry of it in the in the 17 late 1700s early 1800s after thousands of years of blacksmiths you know kind of through very ad hoc trial and error methods figuring out how to work with iron and and make it harder um and and give it a good cutting edge if you wanted a blade or a sword or something we finally figured out what was going on was that there was um carbon uh, in the iron and that getting just the right perfect amount of carbon in there was key to making the metal, uh, you know, really hard and strong, but not too uh, brittle, which would happen if, if it got too much carbon in it as in, um, cast iron. And so, uh, you know, in the 1800s, we finally figured out, uh, through uh, the Bessemer process, uh, you, you might have heard that term. The Bessemer process is a really fast, efficient way of getting the excess carbon out of the iron, so that you can, uh, you know, you can make a good, cheap, um, you know, wrought iron or a hard steel. And uh, it was on that basis that we uh, that we built the railroads, that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, which were originally built of uh, of wrought iron, but which were uh, a, a form of iron that was too soft, and the rails were um, uh, were wearing out from the heavy you know trains that were going over them and had to be replaced like every few months. So we replaced them with steel rails, which lasted for years. We built skyscrapers out of you know steel girders. 
we used steel plows in the prairie to, uh, you know, to break up tough prairie soil and, and actually plow, uh, you know, the lands and, uh, you know, all the American, uh, farms of the, of the 1800s. And, uh, you know, so it's, so, so it became this, uh, this commodity that did wonders for us all over, um, you know, when it used to be this, uh, this thing reserved for royalty. Hmm. That's fascinating. Um, you, you've mentioned here a couple times, uh, how you're working on progress studies. And uh, I, I think, I suspect this is from the, uh, an Atlantic uh, essay written last year by economist Tyler Cowen and um, Patrick Collison, who's a founder of Stripe, um, where they called for a new science of progress and the establishment of progress studies departments at universities and, and, and the like. So why do you think this needs to be a separate area of study. Like, wh why can't this just be something you do within a current disciplinary framework? Yeah. So you're right that that term was coined in that uh, article in The Atlantic by by Cowan and Collison. And, uh, you know, they called for it as a, a sort of interdisciplinary field. And uh, what they said was, look, we already, it's true, we already have history, economics, economic history, history and philosophy of science, um, and so forth, many disciplines that are already relevant. What they said was, one, we need something that's a little more interdisciplinary and pulls across all of these fields to answer key questions. And two, something that's a little uh, more prescriptive, right? Something that uh, doesn't just tell us what is or has been, but tells us what to do. Now, my take on it is that uh, progress studies is not a separate field. It's not something you would go get a new PhD in or, you know, it's not a field distinct from history and economics and so forth. But it's more of a um, a school of thought that conditions how you would approach any or all of those fields. Um, so progress, the progress studies, to my mind, is approaching any or all of those fields with a belief that progress is real, that it's important that it's good, uh, that it's, as I've said before, a moral imperative, and, but at the same time, neither automatic nor inevitable. And when you, and, and so when you, when you come at history, economics, et cetera, with that sort of basic uh, framework of premises and values, then uh, I think it, it changes how you approach the field. It changes what questions you ask. It changes uh, what you consider interesting or important, and it changes what you are going to do with the answers that you find. And so, um, you know, that's what I think we need. It's not a it's not a separate new field, except for you know maybe a small number of people who choose to kind of go interdisciplinary, as in a way I am am doing. I think for the most part, it it falls within history, economics, and so forth. Uh, but it's just a a kind of different way of approaching those that cares a lot more, values a lot more uh, human progress and, and just sees that as something much more important and worthy of study. I think for, for my last question, um, you, maybe you could tell us something about your time as a startup CEO uh, of Fieldbook uh, back in, I think, 2013, I saw. Um, what did your experience as a startup CEO, uh, even of a, you know, Fieldbook ultimately was, you know, failed? Um, but during that, those years when you were trying to get a startup off the ground, running it as a CEO, uh, what did that make you think about the shape of the U.S. innovation economy right now? And does that, did that make you bullish or bearish on the U.S.'s future role in global innovation? Oh, sure. So just for, for context, um, for listeners, yeah, Fieldbook was a startup I worked on for, for five years uh, from 2013 to 2018. Uh, it was an information tool that was basically a cross between a spreadsheet and a database. Um, for anyone who's used uh, another tool called Airtable, it was sort of similar in, in concept and, um, and in form. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, the business didn't really work out. We ended up shutting it down and sort of selling the team in a, in a talent acquisition or, or an aqua hire. Um, what did that, uh, you know, how, what did that make me think about U.S. progress? I mean, look, you know, in some ways, it's never been easier to start uh, a new company uh, than than it is right now today. There are so many resources, both in terms of knowledge. Uh, you know, Mark Andreessen has said that a you know a teenager with a cell phone in a and a and a and some sort of internet connection in a third world country 
it has more access to more knowledge about startups today than he Andreessen did when he was, you know, an undergrad at, um, well, at Illinois. Um, so like the, the, the knowledge and the learning is out there, uh, between so many, you know, sites and blogs and, um, and great Twitter accounts and so forth. The, uh, you know, the, the money is out there. There are so many, um, you know, ways to get uh, funding and to find funding, whether it's on, you know, angel list or through Y Combinator or whatever. Um, and then there's, uh, you know, there's such a, a network of mentors, uh, and advisors out there that you can also, you know, find the same way. Um, you know, because of that, there's sort of more competition than ever. And I think that's, uh, you know, that's one of the difficult things. So, uh, you know, so, somebody said once, it's never been easier to start a company. It's never been harder to grow one. And uh, that, you know, that might be true. I think that's a good thing. You know, more, let's have, uh, you know, one of the things that my broad reading about uh, progress has shown me is that innovation and progress is highly unpredictable um, you can't, it's hard to tell where exactly breakthroughs are going to come from or what form they're going to take. Um, you know, sometimes we see a big goal and we just kind of make an effort for it and we achieve it. And that's great. Uh, and we should, we should keep doing more of that, but sometimes things come totally out of left field and, uh, you, or, you know, or even when we knew, and that can be people didn't know a thing was, was even possible. So they weren't trying for it. It can also be, uh, people knew that something was a grand challenge problem, but the solution was quite different from the form they were expecting. Uh, like in the 1700s, when people were looking at the longitude problem of finding your, uh, you know, finding your position at sea, and um, many people just sort of assumed that, like all previous navigation methods, it would be an astronomical solution that involved looking at the the sky. Uh, and then actually, it turned out one of the key breakthroughs was just literally inventing a better clock or watch, the the marine chronometer. Um, you know, so that's one of these things where the solution was just it came up from this one innovator who had an idea and and pursued it and it wasn't what the kind of establishment at the time you know thought it was going to be and so the 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 upshot from that i think is that we we just need you know more experiments um, we need a kind of like very uh, uh, diversified portfolio of experience. We need to be trying all kinds of different things. And that means we need to remove any and all barriers, uh, any and all kinds of things that are going to filter out you know, um, like certain classes uh, of experiment. You get that sort of thing when there's like too strong of a social consensus around what's going to work or not, or what's good or bad, too strong of a of groupthink, you know, that kind of pervades that, too much of a central um, authority or like centralization of resources such that to get, you know, money to for a certain thing, you must go through this one board or committee or pass this, you know, or, or fill out this one application or, or pass this one set of standards. Um, I think anytime you get too much homogenization and standardization that way, um, you're sort of, you, by nature, any of those processes has blind spots. And so I think we need, um, you know, a, a kind of d uh, diversified portfolio of different ways that we're approaching, uh, you know, innovation and, uh, and, and invention and progress so that, you know, the blind spot, any, any one blind spot will kind of be filled in by a different process that doesn't have that blind spot. Filling in blind spots. Well, that's something that all of us at Building Tomorrow, both in the studio and you in the listening audience, can be a part of. Each of us has different skills, training, experiences, and interests that uniquely qualify us to address blind spots about progress in our own little domains. If we do have an ethical obligation to pursue progress for the sake of future generations, then what are you doing to fulfill that obligation? That's all for today, but until next time, be well. Thanks for listening. Building Tomorrow is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoy Building Tomorrow, please subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.